This episode of Take Back is sponsored by Extreme Chess. Extreme Chess. Normal chess too boring for you, playing against nerds and old men with stupid ugly faces and stupid ugly brains. Well, try Extreme Chess. Dark Extreme Chess. The pieces are made out of knives, which in turn are made out of smaller knives. Double kill! Every time a piece is captured, it releases a cloud of ancient orange. And guess what? The board is made out of fissile uranium. Check me. Woof. Woof. Phew. Extreme Jess. Buy it from Woolworths or somewhere, I don't know. <laughs> Hey, native English speakers, here's a fun game for you. I'm going to show you an element, and I want you to tell me which is the correct way to say its name. If you picked aluminum, you're presumably from somewhere in North America. My apologies, life does get better, I promise. And if you said aluminium, you know, the proper way, you're either English, or at some point in history, your nation had to suffer the indignity of being colonised by the English. Not sure which is more humiliating, to be honest. I mean, I'm a filthy half-breed, so God knows I've got no say in the matter. I was born in the UK, and my mum's side of the family is from the north of England, but my dad's side is all from the Isle of Man, and I've lived here since I was old enough to on myself. So like all god-fearing manxmen, I eat chips, cheese and gravy for every meal and spend 12 hours a day catching herring for the good boys and girls of the village, but thanks to my tainted English blood I have to inject tea into my lower abdomen between meals and I've only got six webbed toes on each foot instead of the regular eight. Aluminium is the most abundant metal in the Earth's crust and is the most widely refined of any metallic element after iron. Aluminium's lightness, flexibility and resistance to corrosion make it a very attractive option for engineers. Almost every train, boat and car produced in the last hundred years has been made with aluminium in some shape or form, and demand for more has only grown each year. In addition, aluminium can also be used to protect food from spoiling. Oxygen, sunlight and microbes in the air will denature the fats and proteins in food to the point of rotting, leaving the food totally inedible for human consumption. The main applications of aluminium in this industry are fizzy drink cans and tinfoil, which for the record hasn't been made of tin since the Second World War, but in my neck of the woods it's still called tinfoil anyway. Aluminium has only seriously been used in industry since the 1850s, which I know sounds like a long time, but not so much when you consider that we've discovered lead and copper artefacts that predate the Roman Empire by about 7,000 years. The reason for this is that aluminium is practically never found in its pure form in nature. The most common source of aluminium on Earth is the mineral bauxite. At least I thought it was a mineral, but I have since been reliably informed it's actually a collection of minerals, at least according to my geology friends, well, acquaintances. Well, the one geologist that edits Wikipedia and probably lives in a hedge. Bauxite can be refined into aluminium oxide, otherwise known as alumina, by a series of chemical reactions known as the Bayer process. And yes, that's Bayer, not Bayer. Don't want to get on the bad side of the Germans. When am I, the Treaty of Versailles? Well, bauxite Bauxite was relatively common, making the pure metal was another story. Aluminium atoms form incredibly strong bonds with oxygen, and breaking those bonds requires enormous amounts of energy. The reason that gemstones like rubies and sapphires are so strong and resistant to heat is because they're primarily made out of aluminium oxide. The only difference is that rubies contain a tiny percentage of chromium ions, an impurity that gives the gemstone its distinctive red colour. For most of the 19th century, the only way to obtain aluminium was through a molten solution of aluminium chloride with molten sodium metal. This process required incredibly high temperatures, had terrible purity rates, and was generally about as cost-effective as wallpaper in your house with the pages of a Gutenberg Bible. Despite being literally the most common metal on the face of the planet, purified aluminium was once more expensive than gold, and industry was crying out for a cost-effective way to make it. Cheap aluminium wouldn't be available until 1886, when by sheer coincidence, a cost-effective synthesis was independently developed by two men on opposite ends of the Atlantic Ocean, the American chemist Charles Martin Hall and the French engineer Paul Hérault. They each came up with near-identical routes for aluminium production totally independent of one another, and in another way coincidence, they were literally born in the same year as each other. Hall and Ayreau were about as different as two scientists can be. Hall was raised in an academic family, and was generally regarded as a studious and pious young man. Ayreau, on the other hand, grew up in the French countryside, and turned to science as an escape from working at his father's tannery. While scientifically gifted, Ayreau was notoriously badly behaved as a young man, and he flunked out of his undergrad course after throwing a wet sponge at his crusty old dean. Even their romantic lives were like chalk and cheese. Ayreau ended up having five children from two different marriages, whereas Hall spent his life as a childless bachelor. Who needs a wife when you can be married to science, I guess? The purification route, now known as the hall Ero process, involved dissolving aluminium oxide in a bath of molten cryolite, then passing an electric current through the soup of molten rock to produce carbon monoxide at the negative terminal and pure aluminium at the positive terminal. Now, in order for the reaction to work, the bath had to be heated up to 900 degrees Celsius. Still incredibly hot, but much easier to reach than the 2000 degrees Celsius required to melt aluminium oxide directly. The hall Ero process still required high temperatures, but the reagents were cheap and the purity 
security was consistently over 99%. Both Hall and Ero became fantastically wealthy as the result of their work, but neither of them were content to sit on their laurels. With his finances sorted, Ero spent the next 25 years liberally lending his expertise to whatever grand engineering scheme took his fancy. Such projects include the first commercial electric arc furnace, water systems for power plants, and historians have even uncovered a precursor to the helicopter in one of his notebooks. Hall, meanwhile, co-founded the Alcoa Corporation, which to this day remains one of the largest producers of aluminium in America. While Ero flitted from project to project, sometimes with great success, sometimes with dead ends, Hall took a characteristically conservative approach, and practically all of his work from 1886 onwards remained firmly grounded in aluminium production. Now, the physical sciences have produced their fair share of prima donnas, and many great researchers would form bitter rivalries with one another, particularly when it came to taking credit for discoveries, and super particularly when large amounts of cash were involved. But somewhat amazingly, Hall and Ero came to be pretty good friends. Ero was the first to submit a patent for the process, but he recognised that Hall was the first to demonstrate it publicly, and he even went on to give a congratulatory speech about Hall's contribution in the 1910s. But this, dear listener, is where our story takes a darker turn. Both men died in 1914, aged 51. Ero on the 9th of May from a cocktail of typhoid fever and cirrhosis, Hall on the 27th of December from a nasty case of leukaemia. The aluminium industry has grown larger than either Hall or Ero could ever have dreamed of. Hope you find the story illuminating.